Cool, so hope we're here to hear something about sonar. Get it, anybody, pun? Oh. Sorry, I'm not very good at jokes, I'll try again. So, um, so we're talking about a product that we're doing kind of as, a, as an R&D prototype. So um, my name's Andrew Turner, uh, if you ever need to follow up with me, I'm just Andrew at Esri, um, or AJ Turner on Twitter, uh, probably respond to the latter more than the former. Um, so I'm the director and CTO of Esri's Research and Development Center in Washington, D.C. Um, I work on, my day job is working on ArcGIS Open Data and ArcGIS Hub, um, but I also help kick off and help uh, one of the GitHub open source admins. Um, work on a lot of other project vector tiles, um, spatial analysis, things like that we've been involved in as an R&D center, trying out new ideas that prove kind of a, it's useful, it's meaningful, it's good architecture, okay, now let's build it into core platform. So Sonar is the one, is one that we're working on now is kind of a, on the big R side, the research side. Um, and then if it all makes sense and things like that, um, it might move over to the D side. So, but why, why are we working on this? Um, and why might you want to care and, and play with it as well? So, you know, we talk a lot about the idea of, of systems of record um, and how GIS helps cities know where their assets are, right? How it operates itself as a system, a system of pipes and transportation and buildings and, and the um, environment around it, right? But this is a very static kind of, um, view of, of what the city and, and these environments and communities actually are. Um, they're actually full of people and people have desires and, and, and visions. And this is a great quote um, a number of years ago that the technology is bringing people closer to the worlds and empowering them to define a future that reflects their values, hopes, and dreams. It's a quote attributed to Jack. Um, I, I don't know whether he's confirmed or denied it, but it's a good one to highlight the point that nobody cares about the street as the people who live there, right? This is where they they make the biggest financial decision in their lives probably, right? It's where they fall in love and they walk their dogs and they raise their kids and they meet their neighbors and get to work. And so it's thinking about the human system that occurs in these cities and, and what makes sense to them to, to discuss and understand their environment. Um, is my neighborhood safe? Which route should I take to get to school or to work? Um, where is a great place to um, uh, engage and go get a book from the library and different things? And so they want to access and an get answers about their city. Right, but they're not probably going to go to quote a GIS to do it. Right, they might go to they they want to have an easy way to access that information um, wherever they are. So part of our work in looking at open data and civic engagement and civic government is looking at about how people want to engage with data and information. Um, this is a research study that um, was done by Pew in 2015, in which they analyzed um, asked the question, how often do you search for government information? And 70% did. Somebody said yes, I'm going to find out things like what what. Um, uh, Police district I'm in, what's my kid's school they should be going to, how what are my taxes I owe, where do I get a hunting license, yet less than 10% actually found on average what they're looking for, right? So not a great experience here to go and find the government websites because they're usually organized around the department, right? They're organized around how they operate, not how people think about engaging with them. Um, and so it's, so there's a, a big gap, there's a 60% gap theoretically by people who actually want the information, have said they want it and be able to find it, right? Um, and really, I'd say hypothetically, everybody's trying to find something out about their government. They just might not have thought about going to the government website to find that information. So what we've been doing and, and uh, what we've been working on for the last four years at Esri on open data and what we're pivoting now with, with Hub is taking all this amazing infrastructure, the digital uh, infrastructure of a city in terms of the GIS of measuring where these things are occurring, where are the roads, where are the bike lanes, where are the crime, where are the libraries, and turning that around into providing these tools for the residents, for the tourists, uh, for the businesses and startups that, that are, are coming in and moving through that town, um, and other partners as well. And I'll highlight, for example, um, uh, I live in Washington, D.C., population 700,000 people. Yet every day there's actually 1.4 million people in the city because people are coming through as tourists or commuters. And that's a very common a lot of metro areas. So even the government they're engaging with, they might not even realize which government that is. So, so that's why we built open data, right? Which provides a rich resource of doing with, uh, working with data. And all this is getting up to kind of why sonar is relevant. Um, so we've seen governments share out data across all sizes um, across the world, from small towns of 1,500 people to multinational governments. And you can now go to hubarcgis.com and search for 100,000 public data sets. Um, and go play with them, right? And great, you can download CSVs and shape files and things like that. Great, raw data, awesome, right? So the question is, is, but how do we make that data actually useful and usable by people, right? So let me skip to getting to it. So what we're thinking about what we call constituent-centric interfaces. And nothing kind of beats the fact is um, what I'm doing right now, I'm interfacing you right now with voice. I'm talking to you and communicating with you, right? And we also use a lot of other uh, uh, interfaces to talk to people, for people to talk to one another. 
So rather than making people come to government and come to the government infrastructure, how can we turn that around and saying meet people where they are? Right? Provide them where are they already and how do we get the government interfaces to those systems so they don't have to come to ours? So we've been prototyping a lot of different um, uh, applications and, and tools to do this. So one of those we did, and, and everything I'm going to show you, everything in this slide deck is open source. So you're going to be able to play a lot with this and take away and, and do much better things than even I'm doing with it, which is my hope at least. So one of these is the, you can play is a, is a tool we call MyStreet. It's very simple. You just type in your address and it says at, at this location where I am now. Here's a bunch of, of, of information of what's going on. Let me just. Uh, do, 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 do. Go. Com slash Esri My Street. Right. And this is a it's a configurable app. So and what I mean by that is it's easy to configure two different ways. Dirt, dirt. In this case. DC. And you'll see the reason I pull up my, my console in a second. So there's two configurations of this, right? So this is a common web GIS pattern if you've ever seen it, right? So one code base, but there's there's two I there's two items that are configured. This is one item for DC, and there's another one. This is an item for LA. So what we do with that item is we actually pull in the configuration for that about about DC specifically. So um, 301 Fifth uh, Street Northeast. And this pulls up, what it does is behind the scenes here is what that actually done. This is, this is actually configured as a web map. So behind the scenes, I have a web map in here. I think it's this one. No, this one, sorry. Right? So if you can see this, behind the scenes, this is a web map. And inside, those are the layers that are the planning and land use, the historic information. Um, Demographics information. So I actually went into the web map view editor in ArcGIS Online and I added a whole bunch of layers to this. And I didn't style it all because it's not really meant to be visual. I'll explain why in a second. That's why it's this ugly thing here, right? But rather than clicking on the map, by typing the address, I'm just this is the equivalent of if I clicked on the map and I get 15 info windows, I'm just saying, oh, let's just pull those apart, right? So this essentially is just all the info windows standing on top of one another, right? What's my trash day? What's my recycling day? Things like that. So meant to be very simple, uh, five layers, whatever, very simple to be able just to see, like, at my address, here's some relevant information, right? And you can do the same thing for um, uh, Los Angeles, 401 Main Street, except it's configured with a different web map, with different layers from Los Angeles. And so what's great is it's very easy to configure and maintain this. That uh, Los Angeles, for example, has a thing called clean streets. They're trying to clean up all the roads, and this is the score, so it's a pretty dirty road, because um, it's zero to 100. So they customize it, but just by laying and moving the web map around our layers, they've added um, what they want their citizens to see, right? And so we're playing with this idea of just because it's geographic doesn't mean it has to be cartographic, right? So, um, so it's very easy to configure this and have information show up to citizens once they type in their address, right? So the geography without the cartography, great. So very simple UI, but again, I have to go to a website or put my mobile phone out and look at it in the screen, right? So it's this interesting idea that we're playing with in, in, into, and this is the underpinning behind Sonar, is this web map is an information product. It's actually the configuration of here's the layers I want, here's how I want those layers to show up. Not visually cartographically, but here's the string text I want to have and how I want that to be show up saying, you know, tra it, if you look in the feature service for trash day, it actually says Thursday. But I want that to say trash day is on Thursday or trash day is coming up on Thursday, right? So what you do is you, you make these different layers. Right, so I've added these layers, this is what I want my citizens to see. And when you do an address lookup, it does a geocode and does like the equivalent of I'm gonna stick a pin through all these layers, I'm gonna do a, a query to the feature service for all of those, get those four results back, um, and I'm going to show them to the user, except instead of just a pop-up window, get rid of the map and just show the info windows, essentially. Right? So info windows, layers, and the web map. So, so now I want that to disappear and I don't wanna see the web map. So, that's great, but what we really want to think about, and the thing I think you're probably here to learn about, is the how does that now come into the idea of even get rid of that interface? If I'm already using Facebook to message my friends, can I ask questions of the city through Facebook? If I'm in Slack, can I do it there? Can I do it through a text message? So, you know, citizens who don't have even access to broadband or, or, or um, a laptop can use their mobile phone to even text in messages and get responses back from their government automatically. Or if you're really cool and you have an Alexa or 
in the future hopefully Siri and, and uh, Google Voice integration so I can just talk to it literally. So whether um, I just want to be convenient because I'm walking around and look something up, find something about my, my city, what is going on, or I might even be um, a, a blind user of poor of sight. So can I actually talk to my government database? Can I talk to my GIS in a very common, accessible way? So let me just show you a little bit what that looks like, and then I'm going to peel apart in terms of how it all works. So um, you can play with this now. Um, again, it's a our research project uh, that you can play with, so it, not everything works all the time. And I'll explain kind of where the difficulties are and where we're playing with it. But you can go to Facebook um, and you can go to the sonar here um, uh, user. So there's a, a nice little cute uh, facebook.com slash sonar here. Because sonar was already taken. And there's a little Facebook page. You can go and see its logo. I, I need to dress it up if I want to build a cool community around it. But essentially, you can message this thing right now. So if you get bored by me talking, you want to go later and play with it, um, if you go here, you as a visitor. So this is what you would see with the internet. So there's a little send message here. You can click send message, right? So cool, I want to talk, talk to Sonar. Except what's also cool is let me do this because it's not just about having a desktop, right? So I can walk around with my mobile phone and I can go ahead and message Sonar. You don't need to see my screen because you'll be able to see what I'm doing in a moment. Uh, sonar. So let me go and look at, I always need to use the cheat sheet right now. I'll talk about that too. Um, message, oh man. Where is it? Send message, man. Facebook is hard to use. Uh, okay. Okay, I won't do it. So I'll go back here. So tell me about trash at this location. So I send that message in. The sonar bot gets that. It actually just called to the ArcGIS server. Went and found the trash. They came back and told me this answer right here. Um, I can do other questions. I can ask about those things. I can say, um, what are the bus stops at Stanton Park in Washington, D.C.? Right? And it's going to come back with, here's the nearest bus stop to you. And just about an hour ago, for some reason, the bus, the, it was, should give me routing directions, and that stopped working. Um, I can go and say, um, I can even go and add information, like add a note. This might, may or may not work right now. I can even, I can even write features into this feature service. Yeah, there you go. To this. So what this is doing is, um, back to here. It's built by a number of building blocks and these different commands. If you look at the, the GitHub repository about what it's doing. So it's built up these building blocks of, of first thing called a skill, right? Sonar itself is a skill. And if you've ever used um, uh, Alexa skills, you might get one for tell me the weather or the NPR app or um, uh, you know, YouTube or Amazon buying, things like that. Those are all skills, right? Inside those, you, you create what are called intents. Um, intents are these commands, like I want to be able to get, um, get information. Intents are I want to get directions. I want to get populations. These are different intents. Then you define these utterances. So um, tell me about blah at blah, right? So it's much like Mad Libs. So these are variables. So tell me about there's going to be a word here that I want to put into the data set variable and at a, another word that's actually a location. And then those are passed in what are called slots. So those are actually, when I get back my JSON response to my code, I now have two input variables that act like a function. So behind the scenes, I'm just writing a JavaScript function. Right, but coming in from the outside, this is how the um, Amazon knows that when I say sonar do something and I say tell me about whatever, it ends up calling and passing in this JSON of a, of a structured thing. And same thing with Facebook. So the support that's currently there is um, for Alexa, Twilio does SMS, Skype, Slack, Facebook. So those, each of those systems, you actually register a developer key with each of those systems. Those just make an HTTP request to, in this case, I'm deploying on Amazon. Um, you can deploy this in Microsoft Azure, you can deploy this on your own if you want to, but I'm using Amazon because it was just easy to deploy to, right? So to an Amazon gateway. This gives me a REST interface, right? That Amazon gateway now uses and says, ah, oh, I have a JavaScript function I can call by, by when I did that intent. That now runs in Amazon Lambda. Lambda is just a large, I want to run a whole bunch of JavaScript code, I want that to scale for me automatically, that's running in Lambda. Again, it doesn't have to. Um, it's just convenient here. And that's where Sonar, Sonar essentially is just a whole bunch of JavaScript modules to handle all of these different intents. So uh, 
a parameter gets called, you, I say, um, get me population, that calls the HTTP API that says, ah, Andrew won the population function and he put in the address of 201 5th Street Northeast DC. Calls the function with those inputs and from then on I'm just writing JavaScript and I return a string. And internally those are actually calling out this, calling out to other data. So why I highlighted the beginning open data is there's 100,000 um, open government data sets that all speak the same ArcGIS API that you can plug into your, on your own. And you don't have to even really do any programming. You just go and choose those URLs, build a web map and configure it and those are called to automatically, presuming they're open, they're, they're open and available. Um, it doesn't currently, Center doesn't currently handle private um, servers. Then we always use another tool called um, Coop. So if you haven't seen Coop, Coop is like a Swiss army knife for dealing with different data formats. So Coop uh, helps if you want to go and talk to, um, I want to do a spatial analysis of Zillow homes in ArcGIS. Coop actually has an adapter that can talk to, sale, uh, talk to Zillow and turn that into the ArcGIS API. Um, it can talk to Salesforce or um, GitHub.com or all kinds of things. So Coop is actually what we use behind open data to do the automatic data transformations. And it's actually being used in a lot of other products um, uh, at Esri now to talk to third party systems that um, are, are not, uh, don't have ArcGIS server embedded in. So um, uh, MarkLogic, for example, is a big XML semantic database. They're actually using Coop to be able to talk to insights. And, that's, and this is all open source, so you can go play with that. My point of that saying is if for some reason you have a third party service you want to tie in with Sonar, you can write a Coop adapter to it. And one example of that is the city of South Bend is using sonar to provide a capability for citizens to ask um, what's, my, what's my current water bill and when is it due? And they have a unique system for doing um, their water management so they wrote a coop adapter to their water management subsystem. It makes that now look and act like an ArcGIS API that they, they use in sonar and dashboards and all kinds of things, right? So I'm highlighting it here because if one of those 100,000 data sets out there that you have in your server aren't available, coop can do that for you. So, Diving in now kind of terms of how the JavaScript works, right? So I, I said before that um, the HTTP request gets parsed apart into all its different uh, slots or tokens. That comes in as a JSON um, body to this function. We're using another great open source library called Claudia. Claudia essentially, it's, it's actually a thing that knows how to talk to each of the different um, uh, Twilio and Slack. So I didn't have to go and read all the devel developer documentation. Claudia is a library that knows how to talk to those systems. So I just use Claudia, Claudia cleans it all up for me, and then we have a function sonar called parse intent. So if I use Alexa, Alexa has a lot of natural language processing in it, so it kind of tells me, oh, Andrew meant, when he said um, how many people live near somewhere, they turn that into population. But Facebook and Slack and text messages don't have really good natural language parsers in there, so I wrote my own function called parse intent to saying, ah, he wrote the string, turn that string into a method. Yeah, so the question is, what utterances are supported? Sure, um, I'll just, so, um, I think I did this, right? Yeah, so, I wrote, I wrote one command called help, right? Um, so overall, it's thinking about, um, I should come back in a second. So, so there is using help, but that was a custom sonar thing. I'll come, I'll come in the end about, more generally about that. Um, it's a good question. So, hey, there you go. So uh, I, 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 I write a function called help, sorry. Um, so I say help, oh, when, when Andrew types, when whoever does types help, I know that's the help function, and help just replies back with essentially a string, right? And it sends that back and then, and um, the Claudia actually knew how to talk back to Facebook or Alexa or t t uh, t uh, text message via Twilio and then those systems know how to then display it in their system, right? So I can handle all that off. As much as possible as a program, I want to delegate all those issues to somebody else so I can focus on my thing. And Claudia and, and takes care of that for me. We have get data ones. And so get data, when I asked about the bus stop, when I asked about population, when I asked about trash days, it says, oh, okay, this is a data request. So first thing I need to do is take the location slot and do a geocode against that. So that calls against the ArcGIS geolocation API, right? And it goes, ah, that is at um, this latitude, this longitude, right? Passes that back. Um, same thing with directions, it calls to get directions and it brings back the routing API responses. Um, I have another method in there, add note, which should have written it to a data layer API. 
Um, get data also uses that when it says, given the location, go and fetch data with that X, Y, and Z. So behind the scenes, Sonar's just calling to the REST um, API, the same as, as you would um, via, as a developer, um, call against that query REST API. Um, I have another one I can show you called get map that actually, oh, sorry. Uh, get map that returns back a map. So the way this looks and is deployed is each of these different chatbots or social media or voice inputs um, call this API gateway. Um, Lambda automatically scales all my, my node functions, so I just have one big uh, node project that gets deployed to it, and then those called all these back and hosted uh, databases and services. Um, it's, it's great because it's cross platform. Again, Claudia gives me the support, so I didn't have to write the code for it. Facebook Messenger, Skype, Alexa, Twilio. Um, Viber, um, Lion, Kick, GroupMe. These are things I, not, I don't use, but they added support for it. So if my community loves GroupMe um, th or Kick, they can. Um, and then it's open source projects. So if for some reason there was a different social network you needed to integrate with, um, like Orkut, if that's still around, you could actually contribute to Claudia to add the Orkut support or something else. Uh, and Telegram. So um, let me talk a little bit about, I don't think I have a slide for it, so I'll talk about <clears throat> the interface, you said the, the intents, right? So there's a lot of interesting research coming out here that it's just, it's very nascent so far, but um, what's referred to as either voice experience or chat experience, right? So you think of user experience is like, what's the look and feel of my application when people log into it? You know, this is the user experience, visual user experience. What's just starting to explore is the idea of how does a, a chat experience work, right? which you start thinking about what's the actual personality of my chatbot, because if you're a human talking now and you're trying to be very natural, you hopefully don't want to talk to a human to a machine, you want to feel like you're talking to a human to a human to an extent. So what you do when you actually design your intents, when you design your chat, uh, chat experience, you have to think about what are the different commands I want to support. So help, for example, is just what I decided to do. I could have also, and probably should, think about adding support for like question mark or what's going on or different things. Um, so you essentially design this text and, and, and chat experience based on what you think is the personality and likely commands of what's going on here, right? But you can keep extending that over time with Sonar very easy by adding just new commands and new intents. One thing um, I am doing here is also I, I am tracking um, not who did it but what's being asked. So just for my own personal kind of user experience research, like much like Google Analytics, right? You put a tracking code um, into, uh, into a website to track where people go and, and how they move through your application doing the same thing here. How do people expect to talk to my bot? What did I actually tell them as a response there? And I'll use that now to prioritize, okay, what are different intents that people want to ask? What do they think they could be asking the chat bot besides help? Because I can also do help um, data, for example. Um, oh yeah, so, and uh, ask about crime. But see, th that what I've failed is that I haven't actually prompted the user in the right way. So I can say, tell me about trash, or tell me about crime at 21 4th Street Northeast, Washington, D.C. So this, this knows how to parse out trash and says, okay, um, or sorry, crime is that that was the most recent crime. Um, and there's, there's a couple other commands there. So um, where the project at is right now is exploring that idea of one, just how technically um, we can have a, a integration between social media platforms and um, your GIS and, and your different APIs. It's starting to explore the idea of what's the right experience there for people to talk to their government and what that's doing, and then giving the opportunity for other cities to explore this. So um, I encourage you to go and check out um, the Sonar project. What's great is um, it's being deployed. There are about four or five cities that are, are deploying it um, now. One of those is South Bend, which is cool, and they've been, I don't know if a visual interface, but they've been playing and adding in better support for Facebook has, you know, I have it here. They have a bunch of, um, Facebook has prompts and they're adding prompt support. We've ad been adding uh, user storage support and Alexa just added support for being able to set your location. So right now you saw I type my address every time. Why can't I just automatically infer the address from the location of the Alexa device or the mobile phone? The chat experiences have been really um, restricted about getting, giving access to location but now they're starting to add that, or at least they're adding the ability for you to ask for it as a tra chat developer. So you can say, hey, if, would you be okay if I stored your location to answer your questions? And you can say no. And so Facebook or, or Alexa won't give me access to that. But you can actually say yes. And then, then from then on, they don't have to type the address anymore. It can geolocate them by their device location of, of the Alexa um, Echo device or their mobile phone application. So, um, 
it's a really interesting project that's it's fun to play with. I mean, go and uh, hack on it a lot. The code's not great, but we're continuing to iterate and improve on it. Um, love to hear kind of from you. Um, uh, be available for questions or via the GitHub repository. Um, what are kinds of different experiences do you think would work? And we can kind of work on that together. So, so I have for you right now. Thank you very much. Any questions? They're doing it independently, um, and they're, um, uh, one, one city did hire Esri Professional Services to, to finish it out for them. Um, and so that they're, 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 they're trying to get theirs out there. They want to be, they haven't shared the code back yet because they want to get theirs launched and do a big press release around it. Then they'll show the code back. They don't want anyone to steal their thunder with what they've added. They've been adding a lot of other support. So I'm hoping that comes out. The one thing they did run into, which I thought was fascinating, is, um, and I'm not even going to say their name because I don't want to give them away, but they submitted their, so they wanted their own custom one. So they, they, they took Sonar and they deployed it in their own Amazon instance and they now added a skill um, to people to find it. When they submitted their skill, they used, they just wanted it to be the name of the city. So um, it's not Arlington, I'll just say Arlington, right? So Arlington uh, County is nearby where I live and they submitted their skill like, hey, it's Arlington. And so, because they, they wanted people to go and chat and the natural experience they wanted was people to go, Arlington, you know, uh, what's the, when's election day? Arlington, you know, uh, what's my um, water bill and you know, all that. <laughs> Amazon said you can't have skills that are based on real world location names. You have to call it County of Arlington or Arlington County, whatever your thing is. So um, it's interesting there where Amazon's being restricted about certain things so people can't like do homesteading. They can't go and try and claim up real world things. But it does now create a, a subpar experience of people having to know the full official name of the government to talk to it or they have to give it a really weird other name. So I think other ones are doing it where they're giving it, they're calling it like Marvbot or Eli or things like that. But it's kind of weird because you have to know that Eli was actually the chatbot for Arlington or something like that. But so again, this is where it's kind of early what people are playing with in terms of what are what's comfortable, what do people work and feel very natural in terms of talking to talking to them. Does that make sense? So yeah, um, so they've been doing it, so generally they can do it on their own. So as your the, the simple answer to your question. But if you really want to, you could work with Esri and we could probably, we could help you out as a like, professional services engagement and then we're looking at the future, like maybe this becomes some capability you can enable for your organization. The, yeah, so you don't, you never download anything, um, which again, it's a nice thing. So um, these, all these skills and int the intent are hosted in whatever cloud provider you have, right? So again, I'm using Amazon, but again, if you use a different cloud provider or you want to run it on your own servers, you can. So those live there. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an API, right? Um, and the API sits there, and then I just register that API. I'd go to Slack, for example. I'd just sign up for a developer account. I'd say, register a new Slack bot. And then I said, oh, when, when someone sends a command, go to, and I registered the URL to that server. And so from then on, everybody, when they're typing the command, it just makes an HTTP request to wherever that server is. And, and all the commands and intents live on that server where you, that you maintain. So the, the question was, just to repeat it, was um, would it be possible with Sonar to saying, Sonar, create me a polygon of 20 by 20 um, in this area and send it to the server? Yes, um, it would. Um, although again, I would challenge you to think about, like, is that the way people talk about it? You know, they say, great. Um, you could say, uh, uh, hey, Sonar, um, Mark, Mark Fifth Street Avenue is closed. And that could even write to a feature service. So it's the thing about the chat experience, but technically behind the scenes, yes, you can write to feature services, you can do, um, we're, we're playing with the ability to possibly use Arc Arcade um, for, for some things there to leverage that the expressions there for more complicated um, operations. So if you've ever played with the Arcade expression language, there's some really cool um, capabilities for even doing some um, analysis in it. Um, and so you could possibly tie Sonar into that as well. So it's things we're exploring there. So I think I'm done. My colleagues, uh, Courtney and Manushi, are here. To, you can talk all about urban analytics. So thank you very much.